So I, I have till five and then then questions, or you want me to finish more like? No, oh, okay. I don't, yeah, I mean, I can do. I don't need to. Oh, cool. Finally getting it together. Nice. <laughs> Only took 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have to take that? No, because I'm a PhD in the UK. So. You don't need it for the PhD in the UK. It's very basic, but it's just a pain. So I'm very excited about our speaker today. Um, I say that every time, but this week I really mean it. <laughs> I think every time, too, you say, I think that was the best speaker we've had so far. <laughs> So, no, I can actually say that I am the most excited about uh, today as anyone 
Cubans with a secret team. Four people who are very close friends. Mm. Who I told you guys how much I like cold email people. I cold emailed it's either you or Andrew about three years ago uh, when I was at Yahoo because I was just very interested in the project they were doing. I just found it to be very interesting. I read about it in an article. I found out where they were doing it. It happened to be a Berkeley. And I cold emailed and said, hey, I want to come in and see if I can help in any way. At the time, I was at Yahoo. Uh, and you know, through all the conversation, we tried to see if there was an industry partnership to do things at Yahoo. And I found out something uh, during the course of that, which is that Steve um, is one of the most dynamic, uh, I would say, science education speakers I've ever seen. He is an extremely technical field, extremely technical. And he has an amazing ability to translate it into a language that we all understand. Mm -hmm. He was a guest speaker for me in an undergraduate business class uh, last year. Thanks, Nima. Uh, wow, well, that's uh, probably the most glowing introduction that I've had and probably the most pressure that I've felt now to deliver on uh, a dynamic speech. But I wanted to tell you a little bit, uh, I do feel a little bit kind of closer to um, a bunch of engineers than I do to a bunch of business students. I think we have a little bit more in common. But I'm not an engineer myself. I'm a radio astronomer by training. I grew up in the UK, hence the weird accent. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm a scientist. I'm kind of an end user of the instrument. But I've got to know a lot about how we actually build these instruments. And I really want to kind of try and approach this from a bit of an engineering perspective today and tell you a little bit about how we're doing uh, what I think is sort of one of the most um, kind of incredible but also sort of bonkers experiments that's taking place here on campus. Uh, and that is the Breakthrough Listen Initiative. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what that is uh, later on in the talk. But first, I wanted to set the scene. And I wanted to take you back about 40 years and to show you uh, an artist's impression of all of the planets that were known outside of the solar system at that time. And the situation has changed since 40 years ago. Um, so uh, there's some engineering actually that's been done that's enabled us to find planets outside the solar system. And here are artist's impressions of some of them and an artist's impression of the Kepler spacecraft, which was responsible for many of these discoveries. So we now know of over 4,000 planets that are going around other stars outside our own solar system. Uh, when I was in high school, there were nine planets. Poor old Pluto got demoted. I mean, that had nothing to do with me, but uh, was that my laptop making that noise? Or? Uh, probably, yeah. That's probably, like, it sounds like a Slack notification, which is weird because I have notifications turned off. Um, maybe I can turn the volume down on here. Is this going to screw things up? Maybe I should just leave it and can kind of deal with the occasional, uh, occasional hey, click in the background. I'm wondering if we should get these lights down too. Can you guys see okay? Just so you guys can get the same lights down. Too. Some of the images are going to be a little dark, so we might want to turn them down a little bit potentially. Yeah. Um, so, you know, Pluto got demoted, but in exchange, we got thousands of confirmed planets. Uh, the reason why these are artist impressions is because it's actually really difficult to take pictures of planets. And even the best pictures that we have, these planets are just single pixels on a detector. But we can measure the properties of them. We can essentially figure out what their masses are. We can figure out what their orbits are. We can figure out their sizes. And hence, we can figure out things like their composition and their surface temperatures and uh, really kind of try and visualize them. And this is actually an artist from the Bay Area, Lynette Cook. Thanks. Um, wow, now, now people will be falling asleep in the back. But, um, Hopefully, now, now my challenge is to uh, not only be the most dynamic speaker, but also to keep everyone awake uh, towards the end of the day here. Um, I think this is better than the other way, because there's going to be some, some pretty dark uh, images here. But I guess for, for folks on YouTube, I apologize that I'm probably now invisible. Um, so we now know that there are planets everywhere. Essentially, uh, if you were to go out and look up at the night sky tonight and pick 100 stars, um, essentially all of those would have planets going around them. 
and about 20 of those 100 stars would have a small rocky planet like the Earth in what we call the habitable zone, which is the region where liquid water could exist on the surface. And this is something, again, I want to emphasize this, that has been enabled by the development of uh, an instrument by, by engineering this Kepler spacecraft with the ability to measure very precisely uh, the brightness of stars and to watch as planets pass between us and the star and to watch for the little dips in brightness that occur as the planets go past. Some other engineering developments have really given rise to other revolutions in our understanding of our place in the universe and one of them was this really pretty uh, basic by today's standards telescope that Galileo didn't design but that he used to look up at the sky and you see some uh, a, a scan of one of his notebooks there on the right as he watched the position of, uh, well, didn't know what they were at the time, but these little points of light that were moving around Jupiter. And he realized that these were actually moons that were in orbit around Jupiter. And this was really you know, revolutionary in our understanding. There's some experimental confirmation that the Earth is not the center of the universe, right? Instrumental engineering development that was used by a smart person to figure out uh, really a paradigm shift in our understanding of our place in the world. And then in the early 20th century, Edwin Hubble uh, used the 100-inch Hooker telescope down, uh, shown, shown in the center image here, uh, and measured the distances to galaxies and combined those with information about how far away those galaxies, how fast those galaxies were moving, and was able to determine what we now know as Hubble's law, which is uh, an indication that the universe itself is expanding. So again, uh, you know, an engineering development that led to a revolution in our understanding actually here that a lot of people thought at the time that the galaxies that Hubble was looking at were actually within our own Milky Way galaxy. They thought they were clouds of gas, that they were nebulae that existed within our own Milky Way. And Hubble and, and the work of others uh, who were working alongside him resulted in this, again, paradigm shift, this realization that the universe was way, way larger than we ever thought it was and that our galaxy was actually one of many galaxies uh, in the universe. And so, you know, again, sort of thinking about engineering, um, thinking about how this can sort of result in, in changes in our understanding. So we've had, uh, you know, Galileo and, uh, and Edwin Hubble and then Kepler and similar instruments like it in that order. Uh, Kepler showing us that planets like the Earth are common. And the point that I'm making here is uh, can we do uh, an engineering development program that actually leads to the next scientific revolution, which I'm going to talk about, which is the detection of life elsewhere in the universe. Is life unusual? Is life unique here on Earth or is the life elsewhere? And particularly now that we know that there are tens of billions of habitable planets in our galaxy, are any of those actually inhabited or are we the only one? I think that seems unlikely to me, but we've got to go and do an experiment. Uh, also was struck by the fact that, uh, you know, we had this anniversary of the Apollo program this year in 1969, 50 years ago. Uh, Neil Armstrong looking back at the Earth from the moon, and there's this great quote where uh, he stuck his thumb up and covered up the Earth, and basically everyone that, you know, you know, <laughs> uh, everyone that's ever existed uh, behind your thumb here, you know, enabled by this, and I don't know whether, who of you have been to, um, uh, you know, any of the, the NASA centers, but particularly the, uh, the Johnson Space Flight Center in Kennedy and the, the center in Huntsville, uh, Marshall, where they actually did this amazing engineering challenge that enabled us to get this sort of paradigm shift, this change in perspective. Um, Neil Armstrong, one of 24 people to leave low Earth orbit and to go around the moon and to look back and to, to have this vision. And, you know, it strikes me as well, sort of in the context of is there anyone else out there, that for a brief period around the end of the 1960s and the beginning of the 1970s, when 12 humans walked on the surface of the moon, there were two inhabited planets uh, for, or two inhabited worlds, I guess, for a while, right? There was the Earth and there was the Moon, and we knew, you know, we became sort of, maybe not an interplanetary species, but, you know, we, we set foot on another world, and I think, you know, I don't want to kind of underestimate the, or, or you know, underemphasize, uh, like, how amazing that was um, then, and how much more amazing would it be for us to find that actually life took hold independently somewhere else, and so that, that again, is what, what the experiment that we're doing is about. Another amazing engineering result, this is uh, actually a composite image, but it's basically a photograph. This isn't an artist's impression. This is um, an image that was stitched together from a number of observations by the Cassini spacecraft. So this is uh, a spacecraft, um, I guess, sort of the size of, uh, I think it's like the size of a large SUV or sort of a, a minibus kind of size uh, that the engineers sent out about a billion kilometers. It flew out past Saturn. It turned back 
and captured this image of Saturn backlit, uh, the, the sun here shining through the rings of Saturn and then the reflections and shadow of the, the rings on the surface there. And aside from what this tells us about Saturn um, and aside from the fact that, uh, you know, what it tells us about engineering and our ability to send things here thousands or tens of thousands of times further uh, than, than the moon is. The moon's about a, a quarter of a million miles. And again, the, the, or, uh, I'm switching units here, but you know, the planets are hundreds of millions or billions of miles away. And um, the, the, the ability to go out there and take this picture again sort of through uh, an engineering achievement, I think, is kind of amazing. Um, but it's also amazing because this picture is also parallel to the one um, that I showed you with Armstrong looking back from the moon because you're all in this picture, you're on that pale blue dot, as, uh, as Carl Sagan said in reference to an earlier picture that's here between Saturn's rings. And so to some extent kind of traveling out and looking back tells us about ourselves, which I think is, is really kind of cool. And I think, again, sort of the search for life elsewhere is also something that's going to tell us about ourselves a lot uh, as a species and as an inhabited world here. Uh, if you want to go to the nearest stars, the nearest stars are 10,000 times further away than the planets, um, so that's really hard. Um, so if you want to look for life elsewhere, uh, you know, one place that you could start is in our solar system, and um, this is an example uh, of um, you know, a, a detection experiment in the solar system. Obviously, this photograph was not taken on Mars. Um, I think these two were. If this was on Mars, then I think you know, we'd be done with, with the experiment so far. Um, but uh, this is uh, in the Mars yard down at JPL, um, where they developed the Curiosity rover, and it's going around kind of scooping up dirt and sniffing dirt on, on Mars and trying to figure out at least are the precursors to life, is there biochemistry, are there sort of organic materials. Um, it's not a life de detection experiment in, in itself. I think you know, a lot of people are arguing for this kind of thing to go on a future lander um, to Mars, which actually might be able to detect biology directly, so it's still kind of a little bit inconclusive. But again, the sort of in situ sampling, I'm, I'm going to tell you about really uh, like three ways that we could look for life in the universe. And one is to go directly and actually kind of, you know, look for chemistry to kind of scoop stuff up and, and sniff it. Um, you might want to fly through the plumes that are coming up from the subsurface oceans on the icy moons of Saturn and Jupiter and send, we've already proven that we can get out to Saturn, send a probe that flies through there and, and does some biochemical measurements. Um, you might also want to go to the nearest stars, and I'm glad I'm going to tell you a little bit about Breakthrough Listen. Th has anybody seen um, this slide, or you know what, what this is, yeah? Yeah, it's the uh, one of the experiments that uh, Stephen Hawking proposed about like uh, expanding uh, legal like solar, solar posts in the universe with like uh, lasers that push the legal uh, sensors and like legal sheets. Twenty percent. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, th this is the Breakthrough Starshot uh, initiative. So this is the sister initiative to Breakthrough Listen that I'm going to tell you about. Um, it's kind of nuts. I mean, you know, as engineers, you should be looking at this and going, "Wait a second! You're going to take a gram-sized spacecraft, you're going to hook it up to a solar sail, you're going to build a laser array which requires, you know, the power of a small city to run. You're going to accelerate this thing to twenty percent of the speed of light." It's got to get out to the nearest stars. It's going to run into a bunch of interstellar dust along the way, which is probably going to like blow a bunch of holes in this thing. Like, how is any of this going to work? And actually, nobody really knows if it's going to work at all. Um, this is sort of you know like big engineering dream sort of stuff where people are trying to solve these challenges one by one in hopes that it one day may become possible. Um, but I'm also kind of glad you know that that people are doing again these sort of. I'll say it, kind of outlandish um, sort of uh, experiments, these outlandish ideas that, that they're coming up with. Um, because, you know, someday we're going to make developments that maybe will, will lead up to this, or maybe there'll be kind of other developments that take place along the way that will enable us to expand our capabilities. Uh, but this really is, you know, our, uh, the only thing sort of uh, uh, in as, is in as advanced a stage um, uh, of design that really might have a chance of going to nearby stars in our own lifetime. And, and even this is going to be limited to a small handful of nearby stars. So in situ sampling really is only going to work in our own solar system, at least, for the, at least for the foreseeable future. So we have to do remote sensing if we want to look for life. And then there are a couple of things that you could look for if you want to do remote sensing. Again, you know, highlighting some of the amazing engineering that's going on. Uh, so there's these kind of 30 meter class telescopes. Some of these are beset by um, sort of political uh, issues that I, I, I'm not going to get into today. But um, there will be 
big telescopes that are constructed uh, in various locations around the world, and there will be big space-based telescopes like the James Webb Space Telescope or successes that have been proposed. One is called Louvoir. Um, there's a mission called HabX, and the Louvoir and HabX and missions like it in particular that probably won't launch until the 2030s or even later are going to be our best shot at looking for signs of biology on planets going around other stars. Now, I already mentioned, you know, planets are points of light at best in images. Uh, you, you saw that point of light that was the Earth as viewed from a billion kilometers away. Now, imagine that you're looking at things that are trillions of kilometers away and you're trying to sense those and imagine the difficulty of doing that and the instrumentation that's required to do that. Um, you probably will be able to do this for a handful of nearby stars and what you would see if you were looking at planets around them for uh, something like Venus or Mars, uh, this is in the, the infrared, you would see absorption from carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and not very much else. If you were looking at a planet like Earth, then you would see signs of water vapor and ozone and other uh, things that were a result of biochemistry. And it's very difficult to get a definitive result on this and to say, yes, that's, you know, water vapor that arose because of biochemistry rather than something else that arose because, the, you know, there's a water cycle there uh, or things like methane and that kind of thing. Um, but it can be an indication, particularly if some of these uh, uh, compounds are out of, out of equilibrium and it, it would actually require biology to sort of sustain that disequilibrium chemistry and enable them to persist over large periods of time. So that's a possibility, but again, it's really hard. So instead, maybe we could say, well, on Earth here, we have an example of biology that developed into intelligence and intelligence that developed technology. And by analogy with biosignatures, maybe we can do remote sensing for technosignatures. And these will be powerful transmitters. They might be uh, powerful lasers, like the Starshot laser, for example, that we talked about. Uh, they might be sort of perhaps a little bit more fancifully kind of megastructures that uh, an advanced civilization might have built in orbit around a star. Uh, if you've heard of the term Dyson Sphere or Dyson Swarm, this is what we're getting at here, these kind of ideas that you might build huge energy collectors perhaps and they'd be in orbit around the star. And maybe you could see signs, again, like those dips that the Kepler spacecraft sees as a planet passes between us and the star, that maybe if there's some artificial structure there, you might be able to detect dips as that is, is moving around. And again, you might say, well, you know, Steve, this all sounds a little bit nuts. Um, like, you know, wh why are they using radio? Why are they using lasers? You know, who knows what they're doing? You know, who knows if they're even out there or, um, you know, if they're even building this kind of stuff. And those are valid criticisms. And, um, you know, we could just kind of decide at this stage, okay, never mind, we're, we're not even going to try and look for them. Or we can actually go out there and, and do an experiment. And that's what we're doing. So um, this experiment kind of has its uh, heritage really from some experiments that were done by Frank Drake at the Green Bank Observatory in 1960. Here is Frank with the Tatel telescope that he used at the time. Uh, and Frank looked at two stars and he used a single tunable radio channel. So he had a spectrometer on the back and he basically kind of dialed through uh, the frequencies and really listened for anything odd. Uh, he found kind of one or two odd, odd things which I think later turned out to be aircraft. Uh, and this was sort of the beginning of really what plagues us as scientists who are trying to look for techno signatures is that our own technology really is far louder uh, radio wavelengths than the things that we're trying to look at that are coming again from typically trillions of kilometers or further away. Um, so even a cell phone or uh, you know a, a satellite or a plane or whatever near the telescope is going to be deafening to the instrument if it's pointed in the right direction. Um, here's a little kind of fun thing that you can play around with. Is anyone here in the audience uh, either seen or played around with one of these little devices. Really fun. I mean, you can see they're like 30 bucks on Amazon. Um, so this is software-defined radio, and you can uh, download some free software. There's some videos online that'll help you install the software that goes along with this. And you can use these to pick up FM radio stations. You can use these to pick up plane transponders, which is kind of cool. So you can actually decode the ADSB messages from plane transponders, and that's the plane telling you this is my tail number, or, you know, my call sign, this is my location, this is my altitude, this is my speed and heading. Uh, and you can decode all of those, the little antenna that, you know, you hang out the window, again, with this sort of $30 kit and some free software. Uh, you can um, pick up, um, you know, vehicle car, car key remotes. Um, and there's some people that have done hacks with these where they're, like, intercepting somebody's car key and using them to do kind of um, things that are probably of questionable legality, but uh, um, sort of fun, fun to play around with. Um, and, you know, some of this is like white hat hacking sort of stuff where it's like, hey, Jeep, you have a vulnerability in your vehicle unlock system that we uncovered using this. But a lot of fun stuff. 
software defined radio, go check it out. And you can actually build, you know, in the same way as probably like my grandfather would have ordered in a mail order catalog the pieces to build a hardware radio, you know, a crystal oscillator and an amplifier and an antenna. You can do all of that in software now, and you can drag these little blocks around and kind of chain them together. And um, you know, if you're thinking about going into RF engineering, this is a really great way uh, to to experiment with that. And there's actually um, a whole open source community, the GNU Radio community. Uh, they have a convention every year, which is really fun. I mean, you go, I've, I've been along to this for a couple of years, and you meet kind of um, a bunch of really wild people that are using this for all sorts of applications: commercial, military, educational, um, scientific, and um, it, it, it's kind of neat. And this comes with a tiny little antenna, which again is not really going to cut it if you want to look for techno signatures that are coming from interstellar distances, so we're going to have to upgrade. Um, this is what you would see actually with some software called GQRX, and this is an example of one band. I'm not going to really kind of go into details of what um, too much of, of what the, the plot is here, but this is a range of frequencies. This is just a, a screen grab from this that I actually just found on the internet, but this is what you'd see if you fired up the software. And so you see in the top graph here, intensity as a function of radio frequency. This is pretty low frequency here. You could do this in the FM band, and you'd see a bunch of FM stations that are sticking up above the noise. And then you see below it here, uh, and the, so again, this is the same information, but frequency now as a function of time uh, in the vertical axis, and the intensity of the signal is represented by the color scale here. And so there's a lot of things, as, as I mentioned, that are transmitting. Uh, you know, you might see FM stations here. Uh, if you're in the FM band, you might see TV, you might see um, GPS satellites, you might see a whole bunch of stuff. Um, but this, this image here, uh, again, frequency on the horizontal axis, time scrolling down on the vertical axis, and then intensity as the color, this is called a waterfall plot um, because it's kind of like water going over a waterfall. The, the water that came over the top most recently is at the top, and then it's scrolling down, time scrolling down towards the bottom. Um, if you're you know, a Python programmer, um, there's tools that we have that enable you to read these in as an image, basically. This is just an array. It's, uh, you know, a, a value as a function of um, frequency and time here. And so you can then play around with these and do um, some data analysis, you know, even run some image processing tools or signal processing tools on that in Python. And I'll, I'll give you some pointers um, as to where some of that software is a little bit later in this talk as well. Yeah, by the way, it's just complicated now. Oh, yeah, sorry, I have a tendency to kind of... No, no, no. Ramble. Yes. Um, so we have not gone longer wave, i.e. lower frequency than this, certainly. Um, and part of the reason why is that actually the Earth's ionosphere is not transparent to radio waves below a few megahertz. Um, so you're just going to get kind of bouncing our own stuff off the ionosphere. So you have to go from you know 10 or 20 megahertz and above. Um, typically, we're doing some kind of pilot programs now that are at um, sort of 60 or 80 megahertz up to about 300. But the majority of the stuff that we're doing is um, gigahertz and above, sort of one to, to 10 gigahertz typically frequencies. And you know, there's not necessarily kind of that good of a reason to, to start there and to do that, um, other than that you have to start somewhere and that we have instrumentation that you can plug into. Um, you know, there's no real reason to believe that a techno signature might preferentially appear at those frequencies rather than some other frequency. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about uh, how you filter out noise? Yes. I, I'm, I'm going to get to that in a little bit, so um, come back to me if, I'm, if I don't answer your, your question later in the talk. Okay. So I mentioned, you know, already um, there are hundreds of billions of stars in our galaxy and probably tens of billions of habitable planets, and then there are hundreds of billions of galaxies in the observable universe, and again, you know, one of the amazing engineering achievements of recent decades has been the Hubble Space Telescope, and this is just a section of the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Uh, so this is one of Hubble's deepest images to date. This is basically several days of, uh, you know, open shutter time where it just stared at one point on the sky in different filters, uh, different wavelengths of light. Uh, the size of this entire image is about the size of a grain of sand held at arm's length. So this is a very small region of the sky. And uh, there's a handful of stars in this image. There's a star there. You can tell that's a star because it has these diffraction spikes around it. There's a star up here. Again, you see with the diffraction spikes, there's a couple more that are kind of off the frame here. 
But the vast majority of things that you're seeing in this image here are galaxies. So that's a, a galaxy, a nice little spiral galaxy. This is a, also a spiral galaxy relatively nearby, another one, another spiral here. But even these little red things and these faint blobs and little kind of distorted things going off into the distance, even stuff like that little thing there, these are all galaxies. There's about 10,000 galaxies in this image. Um, the brightest star in this image, uh, I think it's this one is the brightest uh, in the field, is about 10,000 times too faint for your naked eye to see if you're looking at this region of sky. And so what you're seeing here is a region of sky the size of a grain of sand held at arm's length that would appear completely black if you were to just step outside and figure out where the Hubble was pointed at this time and look at it with your own eyes. And then the Hubble looks at it and it sees 10,000 galaxies going out to the edge of the universe in this little region of the sky, which is typical of any place you might choose to point the Hubble. I mean, some of, the, some of it will be stuff in the way, some of it might be our own Milky Way galaxy uh, in the foreground, um, but wherever you were to point it, you see these galaxies you know, going off into the distance, and then you do a little bit of kind of back of the envelope math, and you realize that in the observable universe there are hundreds of billions of galaxies. So you've got hundreds of billions of stars in a galaxy, and you've got hundreds of billions of galaxies in the universe, and so maybe you've got something like 10 to the 22 places where life could arise. And now, you know, if you were kind of doubtful about there being life elsewhere in the galaxy, I mean, you've got to really think it's long odds if there's no life anywhere else out there in the universe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, one thing is, uh, you know, yes, I agree. It's sort of this sense of like we're just living on this little speck, kind of somewhere out in the remoteness of space. Um, one thing that I find amazing, uh, you know, as a scientist and also kind of again pointing to the, these engineering achievements is that as a human species, we've actually developed. Um, you know, the equipment that's enabled us to understand our place in the universe. I mean, you know, and if we are the only minds in the universe, if there is no intelligence elsewhere, then in some ways we're kind of the pinnacle of what the universe has produced, right? We're the most complex, uh, you know, the most complex um, machine, really, that, that has arisen naturally. And then we ourselves are producing machines that are enabling us to, to have this incredible viewpoint. Uh, and, and one of the things that gets me as well, I mean, this is sort of a little bit off topic, but if you go out to, uh, you know, go up to the, the Sierra Nevada or somewhere where, um, you know, there's a dark sky, you can actually see the Andromeda galaxy with your naked eye. It's our nearest neighbor galaxy, um, about two million light years away. And it's about four times the size of the full moon on the sky. I mean, you think of, you know, these things as requiring really high magnification to make a, a, astronomical observations. They're really more likely to require just a lot of light gathering power, essentially a big a big lens or a big mirror, a big light bucket to collect all the photons. It's not like we're kind of going enhance, enhance, and kind of zooming in and getting more and more detail. Andromeda is really big. It's actually big enough that if you want to, you know, take a, ma a map of it with a Hubble Space Telescope, as some of my colleagues over in astronomy have done, it takes a really long time. You have to kind of move this grain of sand size, you know, pointing thing around and, 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 and make, you know, like do hundreds of exposures basically to, to get that map. Um, again, this is sort of a little bit of a, a, a diversion, but. Those photons that are coming from the Andromeda galaxy, uh, you know, that are hitting the back of your eye, have been traveling for two million years across interstellar space, and that's a relatively close galaxy. And I think that is kind of amazing. You know, somewhere like in sub-Saharan Africa, you know, when humans were just beginning to come about, the light left that galaxy, and then all the intervening steps in human evolution happened, and we migrated and kind of ended up, you know, like. Um, settling everywhere in the world and then we developed science and we developed technology and we developed engineering and you know we built all of this stuff and then you know here you are or here the Hubble Space Telescope is or whatever you know two million years later and that photon is like boy I'm tired you know just just flew in from from the Andromeda galaxy and boy you're my no, the joke's not really going to work but um, <laughs> it hits the telescope and boom like pops out of existence and I kind of feel bad for the other photons that you know came all that way and just sort of you know landed in a parking lot or, you know, bounced off the roof of a building or, you know, like hit a, a, the eye of a cat or something which didn't really appreciate what it was seeing, right? <laughs> this is kind of a weird answer, I know, to your question, but I think, like, we bring meaning to the universe by being able to comprehend it in some way, and I think that is really kind of a cool thing, you know, the fact that we can sort of build stuff that enables us to kind of figure out, oh, I know what's going on here. So that's, for me at least, kind of maybe thinking 
you know, maybe, maybe that's not satisfying to see your hands come up again. <laughs> Yeah, sure. I mean, this is a bit of a complicated question. So, you know, the Hubble Space Telescope can see some of these galaxies you're seeing as they were billions of years ago, which is also kind of nuts. Um, but most of the stars that you see in the night sky, you're seeing as they were a few years ago or maybe a few tens of years ago. And so actually, you know, I'm kind of I'm telling you this, maybe th spending a little bit too much time on background here because I've got to run out of time if I don't move forward. But telling you this in some way to kind of set the stage for, okay, we're actually going to look around uh, planets orbiting nearby stars and just see if we find any of these technosignatures coming from there, in part because uh, the inverse square law, the fact that you put a transmitter twice as far away and the signal that you receive goes down by a factor of four, uh, means that it's you know, uh, energetically a lot more favorable to look for things that are nearby. I'm going to move on. Uh, I, I can you know, do kind of pop your hand up if, if you have questions, but um, I, I want to get through. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so, you know, having said all that, where is everybody, right? This is um, a, a photograph of Enrico Fermi. Um, some of you probably heard of the Fermi paradox, this idea that, well, you know, there's all this real estate out there where they could be living. Um, why haven't we picked anything up yet? Why haven't we seen any visitors? Why is the best evidence of, uh, you know, extraterrestrials some shaky cell phone video that some drunk walking back from a pub shot, you know, in a field in Ohio or something, um, you know, as uh, I forget who it was, but, you know, some, some people have said, like, where are the gear shifters, you know, from extraterrestrial spacecraft? Like, if they crashed on Earth, shouldn't somebody be able to, like, show us an example of, like, this engineering that was, you know, not possible by human hands? You know, why haven't they landed on the White House lawn? Or, you know, why are they not kind of at least sort of... Um, you know, there's no artifacts, there's no evidence that they're in the solar system. I mean, you know, and a lot of this stuff gets pretty fringe, and I should say I want to stay away from kind of UFOlogy here, and <laughs> definitely not about that. Um, but nevertheless, um, you know, we could ask this question, well, you know, why have we seen no signs of them even in uh, these experiments, SETI experiments, I think I've not actually used the word SETI before, but um, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, um, the search for technosignatures, uh, why have we not come up with anything yet? And uh, I think I'll kind of cheat and tell you the answer. It's that we actually haven't really looked hard enough, and also that maybe we haven't had the technology beforehand to do a proper search. And again, you know, I want to point uh, back to some of the other technological revolutions that I, I, I illustrated, right? Those galaxies that Hubble was looking at were there all along, and they were receding from each other all along, and the information that the universe was expanding was there all along, but it took 100-inch class telescopes um, that only came around at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, it took that engineering development to actually enable humans to uh, get the data that they needed to show um, that that was the case. And so we may be at the stage, we may not be, but we may be just at the stage where we have this kind of, um, you know, uh, th these developments that are taking place, which I am going to get to telling you about uh, on the engineering front that may lead to the possibility of a detection. And um, I'm not the PI of this project. I was just kind of sent out, I guess, because we had a lot of media requests when Breakthrough Listen was launched in 2015, and my boss said, um, can you do Fox Business? And I was like, uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so here I am, uh, you know, in their studio in San Francisco. And I didn't see at the time, you know, the, the, the host that was interviewing me. Um, I didn't see all of the crazy graphics that they had that somebody had just Googled, like, you know, space videos. And so they had, you know, pictures of, like, astronauts on the space station. They had, you know, the Mars rovers driving around. I guess it's a bit more relevant since I had those in my talk. It's just, like, space stuff. And she's like, what would aliens look like? <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> um, but I think the, the reason why Fox Business were interested was because uh, Yuri Milner, who is an internet billionaire, pledged $100 million dollars through the Breakthrough Fu Prize Foundation, of which he is also a co-sponsor, over 10 years to expand our capabilities to look for intelligent life beyond Earth. And that is the Breakthrough Listen Initiative, launched in July of 2015 at the Royal Society in London by Stephen Hawking, who uh, also was present at the launch of the Breakthrough Starshot Initiative, which is one of the sister initiatives. Um, and its headquartered, the science team, is, is over in the astronomy department here at UC Berkeley. So my boss, Andrew Simeon, is the principal investigator. 
and there's about a dozen scientists and engineers who are working on, on the team here at Berkeley to, um, to implement this, this project. Um, so we have a slightly bigger telescope than the one that uh, Frank Drake used. It's also at the Green Bank Observatory in Green Bank, West Virginia. Uh, this is the 100 meter Green Bank telescope. So the collecting area here is the size of two football fields. Uh, it's about 6,000 tons of moving parts on this. Uh, this is our chief engineer, Dave McMahon. He's actually in South Africa at the moment. Um, but uh, if you want to talk about the engineering aspects, come find Dave over in the lab and chat with him. Uh, you see for scale here, there are some painters who have just uh, repelled down from uh, painting the surface of the dish, which they do each summer. They have some downtime where they're kind of in the structure here, giving it a new coat of paint. Uh, and some you know, uh, trucks for scale here. This thing rotates, the whole thing rotates on some railroad trestles down at the bottom here. And then there's also a huge bearing here uh, that rotates so the thing can tip up and down. It's the largest steerable radio telescope in the world and it's also, uh, you, you hear it various, variously described as the largest movable structure on land or the second largest movable structure because technically the largest one is the sarcophagus that they rolled in over the remains of the Chernobyl nuclear reactor, but that just stays in one place after it's been rolled in. This thing we're using um, for 20% uh, of the time that it's available basically, so pretty much every day we're on the telescope um, taking observations uh, for the Breakthrough Listen project. And, and so, you know, it's the, certainly the largest steerable object that I can control from my laptop, which is also kind of, kind of fun to do. Uh, this is the Parkes Telescope in Australia. Uh, we also have about 20% of the time on Parkes and a similar instrument down there. And so we kind of cover the whole sky with these big single dishes. This is the largest steerable radio telescope in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, may be familiar if you've um, seen, there's a movie, The Dish, which is really cool about the moon landings and about how plucky engineers at the Parkes Telescope saved the day for NASA by uh, um, sort of filling in when NASA's stuff broke down to get those iconic TV images of Neil Armstrong on the moon back. It's kind of, um, kind of a fun watch. Uh, and what we do, and there's some links to the papers here, uh, I can share slides with Nima or whatever if anybody wants to follow up on, on looking at some of these references, but um, rather than having that $30 little dongle that we have on Amazon that can tune to a couple of megahertz at a time, we spent a couple of hundred thousand dollars on high-performance computing hardware, and this is uh, half of the cluster that we have at Green Bank right now. So these are um, a bunch of what we call compute nodes, uh, each of which um, has, uh, well, I guess in, in total here, we have about eight petabytes of storage on, on this system. And each of these nodes is writing 750 megabytes per second to disk uh, that's coming from the telescope. And essentially what we're doing, again, sort of 20% of the time, hundreds of terabytes a day of raw data, um, we're tuning to billions of radio channels at a time, and we're doing this for hundreds uh, or thousands of stars. Uh, so the experiment has kind of scaled up from Frank's two stars and one radio channel, not to dismiss you know, the, the, the impact of what Frank did in 1960, but basically Moore's law has enabled us to scale this thing up and to build an instrument that really is um, you know, pretty impressive. This is the most capable digital spectrometer that's deployed uh, at any telescope anywhere in the world. Yeah. Because uh, other people want to use the biggest radio telescope or the biggest steerable radio telescope in the world too. Uh, and actually we purchased time, the Breakthrough Listen initiatives have purchased time on Green Bank and Parks. Um, I probably won't get to this, but we have other, other instruments that we're deploying elsewhere where we can kind of piggyback on other people's observations, um, where we haven't needed to actually buy dedicated time to point the telescope. We just say, oh, you're looking over here, you know, I'm going to get a copy of the data and, and look for interesting signals while you're doing that. Um, but trust me, I mean, 20% of the time is generating plenty of data. And, you know, if any of you are doing kind of, uh, you know, math in your head, then you realize these disks fill up pretty quick. And so we actually only archive about 1% of the data. We do um, a, a reduction in size that really is just averaging in frequency and or time. And I, I don't want to kind of get into that in detail, but we can talk about that offline as well. Yeah. Go ahead. So that, yeah, that's one of these uh, 64 computers here. I mean, you only see uh, 32 plus a spare here, but there's another 32 in another room. And so they each get a little chunk of the spectrum. Um, they're each sort of dealing with a couple hundred megahertz, and then you stitch all of that together, which gives you the 12 gigahertz coverage, again, compared to something like 2 megahertz, typically with those $30 things that you can buy online. But otherwise, it's just kind of a scaled-up version of that. 
Um, so I've alluded to this already, but part of the problem with this search is that we're pretty noisy as a species. Um, you know, we have a lot of radio transmitters ourselves. Uh, and even in the National Radio Quiet Zone, uh, which is a federally protected area, um, both for Green Bank and the NSA also has a, a listening station out there, kind of just over the hill from Green Bank. Um, so there's restrictions on fixed transmitters out here, close to the telescope, they go around. I don't know whether there's kind of legal um, uh, weight to this, but they ask people, you know, please don't have Wi-Fi in your house and, you know, please don't use a microwave oven and this kind of thing. And actually, there's also people who think that, you know, Wi-Fi and pg e smart meters and all this kind of stuff is messing with their brains who go and move to, to Green Bank, West Virginia to get away from, you know, the, the electrosensitives, they call them. This kind of an interesting New York Times article about this. Um, and it, it's kind of, it's nice to have them there as well because, um, you know, they complain vociferously if anybody, you know, is polluting the radio spectrum. And so they're kind of good people to have, you know, calling your, your member of Congress or whatever to say, yeah, you know, please don't allow this. Um, but even there, uh, you know, we do we do pick up in the data. Um, uh, you know, things like cell phones. There's also a famous story at the Parkes Telescope of um, somebody thought that they'd made a detection of this uh, fast radio burst. I'll talk briefly about FRBs as well. But um, they thought they'd found one of these that later turned out to be an impatient person pressing the button to open the microwave door before their dinner was ready, and a little pulse of microwaves came out, was picked up by the telescope, and they thought it was coming from space. Um, so that's a that's a fun story. Um, so, uh, in answer to your question, um, you know, how do we kind of see through this noise? Well, um, the, the sort of analog that I have here is with a directional microphone uh, where, and thank you for all being um, very attentive and for not kind of, uh, you know, talking during the, the lecture here, but if you were in a, a noisy room where a lot of people were talking and you were trying to isolate one conversation that was taking place, you might want to have a directional microphone that you kind of scanned around the room and you pick up a lot of background noise and a lot of other signals, but it, uh, at some point, okay, I think that's a signal that I'm interested in. I'm pointing at that one person that I think is talking right now and I'm picking up the background noise, but I'm also picking up this one conversation that I think is interesting. And then I move my directional microphone away and I'm still getting background noise. Maybe the background noise has changed a little bit, but that one signal that I think is the interesting one has gone and then I move my microphone back. Okay, I'm picking that signal up again, and I can do these on-off comparison observations basically with the microphone that can then help me localize the position of the one signal that I'm interested in. And we just do the same thing with the Green Bank Telescope, which happens to be you know, very directional, and it's a high-gain antenna, and it's a big, uh, big dish here uh, that basically enables us to point the telescope in the direction of a, a target of interest in the direction of a star that we're interested in. Um, so this is, some of you may have seen these polar plots of antenna sensitivity, so it's most sensitive in the direction that it's pointed in, and then the sensitivity falls off a lot, but it does also have these side lobes and also a rear lobe here, and this is the one that caused problems with the microwave at Parks, because the microwave oven was kind of somewhere down here, and so it still has some sensitivity, even kind of pointing backwards. You think you're looking over here, but somebody behind you is, um, you know, um, open, uh, you know, microwaving their ready meal and, and causing problems for you. Um, but this is basically what we do. And we get spectrograms just like the ones that I showed you, these waterfall plots. Um, so this is a waterfall plot from breakthrough listen data. And this is the output of one of those compute nodes. So again, you're seeing uh, it's 187.5 megahertz in frequency. And then you're seeing the time axis. I guess the time axis is, uh, oh, that's right. Okay, yeah, the time axis is going down this way. And then you're seeing intensity as a function of frequency and time. Uh, and there's these kind of, um, vertical black lines that you see in here, which are actually an artifact of the, the filter bank that we're using. It's basically the way that we channelize the data. But you also see some signals in here, and you can see you know, these kind of wiggly signals that are picked up uh, over here. So this is um, you know, a real radio signal that's coming in from somewhere that the telescope is picking up. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that wasn't my experiment, I should say, um, but they really, I mean, they were seeing a bunch of these. Um, so there's a whole kind of story about the discovery of fast radio bursts. They did later turn out, like, some of them really are astrophysical. Some of them are really coming from galaxies that are uh, billions of light years away. And the reason why we know that was because we were able to localize them and to find, yeah, the position of this thing corresponds with this galaxy. Some of them repeat. Um, so actually, you can go back and see the same signal coming from the same galaxy over and over again. Um, but for these kind of weird ones, um, you know, and this was sort of in the early days of, of work on fast radio bursts when people didn't know, you know, are they astrophysical or not, 
um, they were plotting when they occurred, and they found that a bunch of them occurred around lunchtime, and astrophysics doesn't know when lunchtime is. So, um, and then they were like, oh, wait, it happens when we're pointing in this direction, and wait, what's in the opposite direction now, the cafeteria? Um, and so it was some really good sleuthing, actually, that kind of, um, and then everyone's disappointed because they're like, oh, maybe none of these are real. Maybe it's all just the microwave oven. But then later it turns out, no, actually, some of them really are, and there's very good evidence now. You know, there are some of them that are astrophysical, which is kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah, so this sort of got back to an earlier, or earlier question or an earlier point that I made, really, which is that I don't think there's any specific reason to target the frequencies that we're targeting. We're just targeting ones that uh, there are receivers available at the telescope that we can plug into with sufficiently wide bandwidth uh, that we can digitize that data and stream it to disk without being overwhelmed by too much bandwidth. So it's sort of there's some engineering considerations, really, which have led us to focus on the region that we're looking at, um, but you know, if, in this example, I mean, we actually do have data, uh, you know, at 2,500 megahertz that goes to the, the next compute node in the rack. Um, but if you only had this one compute node, if ET is transmitting at 2,500 and you're not looking at that frequency, you're not going to see them. So, uh, you know, that's another possible answer to, you know, where is everybody? Uh, might just be you're looking in the wrong place. But we're looking very hard. Uh, you know, as hard as we know how to do in the places that we're capable of looking right now, we may we may change that at some point going forward. Yeah. So, um, are there any plans to put telescopes like this on the moon? Or <laughs> use this, uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, not telescopes like the Green Bank Telescope, because getting uh, it's like 8,000 tons, including the the sort of support structure, getting that onto the far side of the moon, uh, you can do the math in your head as to how much getting, like I think a kilogram to orbit is, uh, to Earth orbit, low Earth orbit is still like a thousand dollars, so I don't know, somebody do that math and tell me how much it would cost to put the Green Bank Telescope on the far side of the moon. Um, there are ideas of putting low frequency, simple dipole arrays on the far side of the moon. Uh, I think right now, if you had I don't know, a trillion dollars to spend. I mean, we have a hundred million dollars to spend, but if you had a trillion dollars to spend or whatever it would cost to do this engineering thing that you're proposing, um, uh, you know, the right way, I'd probably rather, uh, you know, put some LinkedIn ads uh, up and, like, hire everyone away from Google and pay them all a million dollars a year and have them, or, or Yahoo, and have them come um, fix our data analysis uh, for us. So that would be easier. Um, there was one question in the back first, then I'll come to you, Neil. Yeah, so actually it turns out that's not that much of a contaminant for us. Um, natural uh, astrophysical sources of radio waves, um, the narrowest uh, frequency emissions are from astrophysical mazes, um, which are kind of weird objects. Again, I don't really want to get into this, but they're typically at least a few hundred hertz in width, and so most SETI experiments can find themselves to looking for signals that are just a few hertz wide. Essentially, there's too much energy packed into a narrow range of frequencies, for it to be produced by a natural process. So we can get rid of this kind of broader band background of astrophysics and focus in on things that are artificial. Um, the other thing is even for broadband human generated signals, there may still be a sharp edge there. So you could have something that's a kilohertz wide, but it still kind of cuts off much more abruptly than a natural source would do. Yeah. How would you communicate with the It's not line of sight. I mean, um, you know, you probably would have to have an orbiting relay station. And, you know, again, this sort of highlights another problem with doing this, that by the time you have the technology to build this, there's probably going to be astronauts on cell phones up there, and it'll have ruined the whole kind of radio quiet environment anyway. So, yeah. Um, you need some kind of relay or, uh, you know, data storage, then then uplink when the thing passes, and then it downlinks to Earth when it comes around the other side, that kind of thing. Okay, so, uh, right, so going back. So, you know, how do you know if this is ET? Well, you do what I suggested that you do with the, the microphone, and you do an off observation, and then you compare the two things. So this is off the star. There's this star with some catalog number, and now we point it off the star. And if you want to see whether you've seen ET, then you do that a few times. Uh, and what we do with Breakthrough Listen is we do three pairs of on-off observations. So you go on, off, on, off on, off, and again, this is just the output of one of these compute nodes, so 187.5 megahertz, uh, five minutes of time in each of these slots, so this is 30 minutes of time on the sky. 
with a little bit of time in between when it takes, and it's only really um, 20 seconds that it takes to move this 6,000 tons by a short distance to point to an off observation, and then you slew the telescope back to the point that you were looking at, and then you move it off again. Uh, and this is the output again. These are these, um, these waterfall plots, these dynamic spectra that are stored uh, by the breakthrough lesson back end that we then look at after the fact. And, you know, I, I, I tell our undergrads working with us this, it's like, it's trivial, right? Now all you need to do if you want to find ET is just look for things that appear in the top row when we're pointed at the star that are not there when we appear in the bottom row when we're pointed away from the star. Um, turns out there are a lot of interfering signals, so part of the problem is just dealing with the fact that you do this experiment, and again, over the kind of range of frequencies that we're looking at, there might be tens or hundreds of millions of signals, depending on where you kind of set your threshold, your detection threshold. And some of the signals are complex. I mean, some of them, like, you know, the human eye might be pretty good at saying, okay, I think that's a signal, I'm going to kind of draw a box around that and call that a signal, but unless you have some kind of smart algorithm that can figure out this is, you know, a distinct thing from this, or that, you know, these lines here should be treated similarly, and that that thing should be treated differently, or these squiggles are part of the same signal. You know, it's hard actually to build image processing algorithms that can do that very well. Um, but, you know, just by looking at this by eye, again, you can say, well, okay, I think this signal here is probably the same signal as that signal there, these two vertical lines that appear in this plot. And actually, you know, now that I look at this carefully, I think these two lines here are probably also the same signal as that. And, you know, maybe I can see something a little bit faint in here. It's kind of coming and going. Then you're like, wait a minute, 2,400 megahertz. And then you go and look at the back of your Wi-Fi router, and you're like, 2.4 gigahertz. I knew that number was familiar. 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz are frequencies that are in common use for Wi-Fi. And this is probably somebody at the telescope with their damn cell phone waving it around, saying, why can't I get a Wi-Fi signal out here in the middle of the National Radio Quiet Zone? And the telescope is exquisitely sensitive, and even if you're not where the telescope is pointed at the time, you're like the equivalent of that microwave oven, and the telescope's going to pick it up, and we're going to see it in the data. So this is what we have to get rid of. We have to detect all of these junk signals and then throw them out. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think probably what happened first was that Green Bank was built out there and, you know, Moore's Law is kind of our friend in that it enables us to develop this technology, but it's also our enemy in some ways uh, in that, you know, there's more and more technology. I mean, you know, Elon Musk just launched, uh, you know, he has plans to launch thousands of these Starlink satellites that are going to provide internet access all over the world. And, um, you know, that's going to be bad for radio astronomy. It's going to be bad for optical astronomy as well, because the things reflect light. Um, it may have been good enough at the time, basically, to get, you know, three and a half hours outside of Washington, D.C., um, but I think it's also probably that the observatory happened. I'm not familiar with the history, whether the observatory was there first, and then they kind of drew a box around it and said, let's make this radio quiet, but it's pretty good. I mean, it's radio quieter. Um, it's, it's one of the more radio quiet places in the United States, so it's, I don't want to say it's terrible, but as there's more and more stuff in orbit, um, it's becoming more and more of a challenge. And so we have to either go somewhere else, like the far side of the moon, or we have to solve this algorithmically. And this is kind of the, the point that I'm going to get to next, basically. Do you have another question? Anyone? Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, so we have a couple of papers uh, from 2017 and then more recently in 2019 uh, and associated data releases where we've gone through and we've said, okay, now let's actually look. So these, these you're now seeing um, uh, what we call cadences. So this is one of those on observations immediately followed by an off observation. And here's an on, and there's an off, and here's an on, and there's an off. And if you were paying attention to what I was saying in the previous slide, so rather than being just the top row having a signal in the bottom row not, um, and these, the way that we've laid these out here, what you should see is alternating signal, no signal, signal, no signal, signal, no signal, and that's your ET candidate, that's your techno signature candidate. It doesn't really rise to the level of a candidate, um, you know, unless you've got more confirmation. But these are sort of the best, the best things that we've seen so far, where you can see the signal is drifting. I'm not going to get into this, but um, I, I guess I can in kind of questions afterwards if you want, but this is sort of another filter that we use for things that appear to be um, moving relative to the telescope because they've got a Doppler drift, and that's consistent as you come through here. Um, so, you know, potentially this thing could be coming from a planet going around the star that we're looking at, and then we move away, and the signal goes away, and we move back, and it's back. Um, 
there's various reasons why we think that these, there were like 11 of these that came out of our initial data set, and there's various reasons why we think it's not ET. Um, mostly, actually, that most of them are at the same frequency, and it happens to be a frequency where there's a lot of interference in the spectrum, and so even when you do these kind of careful cuts and you're sort of passing things through these thresholds and requiring that they survive all of these criteria, you're still going to get a few things that kind of slip through. Um, what you would want to do, you know, if you really do, and you're welcome to do this, if you believe that any of these are ET, we published the coordinates and the times that we were looking at them, and you could go and look back at that star again and see if you see the same thing, and that would actually be pretty exciting. If you look back at that star and you see that same thing that you don't see anywhere else, um, then, then that's, that's very exciting. The fact is that we see, you know, some of this stuff in other places, uh, and it all looks pretty similar, so we think that it's human-generated interference in these particular cases. I can come back to this if there's questions on that, but um, these are sort of the, the greatest hits, and they're not that great, um, but it's the kind of thing that we're looking for. Um, so I kind of alluded to this, but there's a lot of kind of search space that we have to look through, and you could choose to put your resources in expanding the range of frequencies that you're looking at. You could choose to put your resources in getting finer spectral resolution. You could get finer time resolution, you could get more time coverage, you could get wider bandwidth, you could expand the area that you're looking at, the field of view of your telescope, you could get better spatial resolution. Um, and these, this is a, a plot from Mike Garrett, who is uh, the director of the Jodrell Bank Observatory in the UK. And um, I think, you know, that I agree with Mike on this. There's kind of a couple of things that he says that we should highlight. One is actually field of view, so we should be looking at large areas of the sky, uh, as well as looking at these kind of intense um, sort of staring observations of individual stars. Um, but really kind of one of the key, thing here, key things here is would I actually recognize a signal in the data if it was there? Would I be able to detect it and say this one looks different to the others? And, um, you know, looking for a needle in a haystack is uh, always kind of a difficult challenge, particularly if you don't know if there is a needle in the haystack and you don't know what the needle looks like. Um, you know, it could be a sewing needle, it could be a knitting needle, it could be the Seattle Space Needle. Um, you know, you, you really don't know ahead of time. It's like, what, what might ET be doing? Well, maybe something similar to us, maybe something different. Um, anomaly detection is really something that we care about. And actually, you know, we really want to build um, a generalized anomaly detector. Uh, Silicon Valley has, has figured out how to do this, how to find ET. Um, you go to Google image search and you type ET in and you get lots of pictures of ET, including my favorite down here is ET dressed as Mr. T. Um, <laughs> so that's, you know, really like, wow, what a great algorithm that is, <laughs> you know, that it can find that. Um, and so, you know, some of you will be familiar with how um, Silicon Valley does this and actually our sponsor, Yuri Milner, who's an internet investor, among other things, said at the launch of the program he wanted to bring the Silicon Valley approach to the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Uh, and we interpret that, we're like, huh, what does that mean? Well, we interpret that as using some of these algorithms, using these kind of, you know, um, like big data, uh, using sort of scalable um, approaches that can be applied to the big data um, that can find either things that look the same in this case. So it's like, okay, I mean, these are, um, you know, again, if you, you're familiar with how, how um, this works, this is basically a neural network that's been trained on labeled data, so it finds text that's adjacent to these pictures, and it says, oh, well, when, when ET occurs in text, it, it often occurs next to a picture that looks like this, and so it's then able to recognize the same as it could recognize pictures of cats and dogs, and this is how, you know, we train infants. We don't give them, uh, you know, a, a vocabulary book. I mean, we do when they're older, but initially you train them by pointing at cats and saying cat, and you point at dogs and you say dog, and you're providing labeled data for the neural network that later, you know, figures out how to process this. Problem then being, if you've trained a child to distinguish cats and dogs and you show them a horse, they're like, okay, well, it's either a cat or a dog because those are like the two things that exist. So, you know, I've got to put this in one category or another. Um, so this is sort of the, the limitations of, um, you know, a supervised learning approach if you're doing this. Um, you might want to develop approaches that are more about clustering where it's like, okay, I don't know that this is a cat, but I'm going to put all the things that look similar together here and then, you know, call that something which later turns out to be cat and these other things that look similar that turns out to be dog. And then there's this other thing that I don't know what to do with over here that looks nothing like these other two things. Oh, that's a horse, right? So this is really what we want to do, I think, with... Um, with some of the data that we're working with is to do, you know, to build um, an anomaly detector that tells us one of these things is not like the other stuff. Uh, I'm rapidly running out of time. Um, these are some examples of those fast radio bursts that I mentioned. So again, you'll see a waterfall plot at the bottom here. It's been rotated, so the time axis is now horizontal and the frequency axis is vertical. Um, 
you know, just a, a preference as to how these are plotted. Uh, and these are a bunch of these bursts that were found from one repeating fast radio burst actually using our instrument, using the Breakthrough Lesson backend of the Green Bank Telescope. Uh, and it found a bunch of these. I'm forgetting exactly how many. It's like 20 of these um, coming from the same position. And this is also one of the reasons why we know that these things are astrophysical is that they only appear, you know, in certain locations. And this one was pointed at this thing that we know is the host galaxy of this object. Um, and so we have algorithms that can find these things. Um, but we've also, there was a grad student in our uh, group, and now, like, for inexplicable reasons, the frequency axis is now flipped. So you're seeing these things with curvature going the other way. Uh, the FRB, if it wasn't obvious, by the way, is this um, quadratic shape here. So it has this distinctive curvature, which, again, I'm not going to get into why that is. Um, but uh, Jerry, uh, who is a grad student with our group, trained uh, a neural network to find things that looked like the ones that you saw in the last slide, the kind of 20 of them, and this algorithm found another 70 of them that had been missed by the existing algorithm. So that's kind of cool. I mean, it shows you the stuff hiding in data here, but if you have a, a smart algorithm that knows how to pull that out, then you have a chance of finding it. Um, so, you know, again, Andrew, um, our... Uh, uh, our, our principal investigator is also on board with this idea of building uh, a generalized anomaly detector or a sort of serendipity machine. And uh, I'm not also going to really get time to go into this, but these are examples. So here you just have an on and an off. Um, and here's another on and an off. And this is also work by Jerry Zhang here that you can go and follow up on. And Jerry uh, trained um, a convolutional L LSTM. Um, so this is uh, basically something that um, has some knowledge of uh, how things evolve in time series. And then you have uh, a discriminator network, which basically is saying, are, is this coming from real data or not? So you can read the paper if you're interested. But basically, what you see on the left here is real data. And then what you see on the right here is a generator that has been given the first bit of data, the on, and then has to predict what the off might look like. And then again, it's been given the on and has to predict what the off might look like, given what it knows about the whole data set and about how the data evolve. And it's, it's pretty good at doing this. It knows that that should be followed by something like that. Oh, OK, well, that's cool. That should be followed by something like that. Yeah, that's great. This should be followed by that. Oh, wait, hold on. There's something missing there. And actually, this on the left, again, is what you would expect to see if this was a real technical signature signal, right? The on has the signal. The off has the signal missing. And the algorithm here has learned that normally when we see this, it continues, and so th this is an anomaly. This is something that you could kind of, you know, draw a circle around and say, I want to look at that more. It's not necessarily ET, but it's something that an algorithm like this could flag as being something that, that you want to take a bit of a deeper look at. Um, this is actually a detection of extraterrestrial intelligence. Um, it's not uh, aliens, but it is extraterrestrial because this is the Voyager spacecraft. It's intelligence because, you know, we built it um, and sent it out to the outer solar system, but I think this is really pretty cool. Uh, so this is now about 20 billion kilometers from Earth. Uh, and this is with the Breakthrough Listen instrument at Green Bank. So this is an observation now. Instead of seeing the waterfall plot, you're just seeing the, the integrated spectrum where it's added up. Uh, and you see the, um, uh, the carrier here, and you see the data channels here. And we're getting this thing loud and clear from 20 billion kilometers away, even though the transmitter is 20 watts. So it's like the light in your refrigerator basically transmitting across um, 20 billion kilometers of distance. And you have a, a big antenna with a lot of gain. You point it at it, you can pick the thing up. And so, you know, I'm joking, it, you know, it's not ET, but it is a very good proxy for, um, you know, what, what we're hoping to see, again, from distances that are thousands or tens of thousands times further away. And so for things that are millions or hundreds of million time, millions of times brighter. Um, there's a Jupyter notebook that you can go and play around with some of these data, and you can actually kind of zoom in from uh, the spectrum as a whole. So again, this is one of those compute nodes, and then <laughs> so we don't do this zoom thing, but you can imagine you zoom in, and then here here's the thing that I just showed you, and then zoom in again to get the data and the carrier and the other data signal here, and it, it's kind of fun to to play around with the data a little bit yourself. Uh, there, again, I'll give you the slides, but you can go and kind of play around with some of the data and some of the um, Python notebooks and that kind of thing um, and help us try and find ET. Uh, I'm going to skip over this. That's about the optical search, um, which I can come back to. Well, I want to answer a few more questions as well if, if people want, plus, like, talking to people for an hour in the dark kind of uh, probably ceases to get fun for everybody involved at some point. 
Um, I, I mentioned we have a lot of uh, raw data available. It's actually about a petabyte of data that was released earlier this year to the public, along with some analysis software and some accompanying papers that go along with that. Uh, and I wanted to close um, by uh, just showing this picture. I, I love my wife and I live down in Oakland and we have a dog that we love to take hiking up in the Oakland Hills and this is I think up in Redwood Regional Park, a photograph that I took, you know, beautiful um, natural place to go out and hike there. And, you know, sometimes it's a little bit worrying, you, you're hiking up there and you see these signs, it's like um, mountain lions have been seen in this area, you know, there's activity of mountain lions. Oh, should I be concerned, you know, should I be worried about the dog running into a mountain lion? Well, I don't see any mountain lions in this picture. So I conclude mountain lions do not exist. That would be a little foolish uh, if just because you don't see something, you don't think it's there. I mean, there could be one, you know, hiding behind this log. I don't think there is, but it could be one, you know, behind this tree. Um, they might not be active at this particular time. I don't know much about mountain lions. Maybe they come out in the evening and we're there in the morning, or, you know, maybe they're actually kind of avoiding us for some reason. I mean, there's a bunch of reasons why we might not have made a detection uh, that, uh, don't rule out the fact that they're there. It just means we haven't looked hard enough yet. And so, um, uh, you know, I think we shouldn't be discouraged that we haven't found any signals yet. And again, I'd just like to kind of point out that the, the developments in engineering really are the things that give me the most hope that we might actually be able to make a detection in the near future. And I want to close with a quote from another um, seminal paper, uh, the 60th anniversary of which has just passed by Kokoni and Morrison, two physicists shown here, uh, and in regards to these technosignature searches, they say the probability of success is difficult to estimate, but if we never search, the chance of success is zero. And people might ask me, well, what are the chances of success for, uh, you know, SETI today? And my answer is, well, they're better than they were, uh, you know, in 2014 before the Breakthrough Listening Initiative launched in, in 2015. I can't tell you what they are, but I do know that, you know, we have more of a chance right now because of the incredible instrumentation and, and engineering uh, and scientists uh, that we have working on this and algorithms and all of the stuff that we're learning from Silicon Valley and you know, applying to this, we have more of a chance today than we really ever have done in human history and that's kind of a, a cool position to be in and sort of a cool time to be working on this project. Uh, you can find us on the web, you can find us on social media, um, you can get my email from Nima and I'm happy to take a few more questions, thanks. And if you have to run out, you know, I totally understand as well. I've gone over. So. Yep. Yeah, thanks. Uh, first of all, thanks for being here today. That was just fascinating. Talk. Thanks. Um, do you know what the factor universe are? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, good question. Uh, at one point, there were more theories as to what they are than there were actual fast radio bursts, which is not a good position to be in. Um, it's been narrowed down a little bit. Uh, there is actually a very eminent astronomer, Professor Avi Loeb, who is the chair of the Harvard Astronomy Department, who has written papers suggesting that maybe they're aliens. I don't think they're aliens. <laughs> I think aliens should be your last resort for an explanation rather than your first resort. I mean, I'm being a little bit disingenuous to Avi here. Um, you know, I don't think he's claiming they definitely are. I think it's been reported in the media sometimes that you know that's what he thinks. But it's like, well, what might it look like? Could it possibly be this? Um, we're not, you know, we think that's, th that we should rule everything else out first. Um, what they probably are is something related to neutron stars. Um, so neutron stars are the end point in the life of stars that are more massive than the sun. So they're bigger than things that will form a white dwarf, but they're smaller than things that will form a stellar mass black hole. They're still pretty extreme objects. So a neutron star is uh, essentially the mass of the sun compressed to something that's about the size of the Bay Area. They're like 10 kilometers across. Um, some of them are rapidly spinning, so you may have heard about pulsars. Um, pulsars also just celebrated an anniversary, um, I think the 60th anniversary of their discovery by Jocelyn Bell Burnell using a telescope, again, kind of cool engineering uh, in, in the UK. Um, pulsars put out these bright radio pulses um, because they're rotating, they have magnetic fields and they have kind of stuff that is you know, electrons that are entangled in magnetic fields and they sweep past you like a lighthouse and send out these pulses. Some of them are spinning as fast as a kitchen blender, which is also kind of nuts. So they're putting out, some of them are putting out one pulse every, every millisecond or so. They're rotating, you know, uh, once a millisecond. Um, so something the mass of the sun, the size of the Bay Area, rotating once a millisecond. 
Some of them are so highly magnetized that if you put one at the distance of the moon, it would wipe everybody's credit cards on Earth. Um, so these are pretty extreme objects, and you know they're sort of one of the most extreme objects that's known in physics. And so when you ask somebody, well, what could produce uh, a millisecond long pulse uh, that's coming from uh, a distance of uh, you know billion light years away that we're still able to pick up, uh, that is kind of pretty broadband um, in in frequency. Kind of a natural explanation is some process coming from one of these highly magnetized neutron stars or magnetars. Um, and so there's theorists that are putting a lot of thought into this, but I think it's probably, it may be like a magnetar. Some of them may be magnetars being born, or some of them may be, you know, the end point of the life uh, of, you know, a massive star or, you know, something, a collision between neutron stars or something like that. But because we know some of them repeat, we know that at least some of them are not catastrophic events. They must just be something where the same thing is kind of you know, glitching in some way and putting out these pulses. So it's an open question, but I'd be willing to not put a lot of money, but I'd probably put a little bit of money on this being magnetized or something like that down the line. Yes. Um, well, it's, yes, in part, it's also a contrast issue, and in fact, we do have direct imaging of some planets, uh, and I believe most of those are in the infrared, um, where there is more of a, a contrast between the planet and the star, so it's a little bit like a firefly next to a searchlight, right? It's not even necessarily just the brightness of the firefly, it's that you've got a, a contrast issue, kind of picking that out of the glare, um, and you can do that... Um, you know, with an algorithm, or you can actually do that with, um, you know, some hardware, and actually, you know, there's experiments that uh, have been done, and also experiments that may fly uh, in Earth orbit, where you actually kind of maneuver a star shield into position at some large distance away from your telescope, and position that really precisely, so you block out the light of the star, and then you can just about see the light of the planet. Um, but, uh, sorry, uh, maybe I'm getting off topic, but fin finish it. Uh, well, there's a lot of uh, continuum light from the star as well, right? The sun doesn't, the sun puts out white light. Basically, it's not just putting out lines in, in hydrogen and helium. Um, so, you, you, you know, the sun is very bright. Seeing faint things next to, next to the sun is very hard. Um, so, you know, again, like, it's an engineering challenge. <laughs> Basically, there's nothing in the laws of physics that tells you you can't do that. But it's really pushing the limits of the instrumentation that we have right now. Um, that's a good question. I mean, I think um, gravitational lensing is going to be minimal for anything that's coming from a nearby star, and so the majority of the stuff that I've talked about um, today has been observations of stars that are a few light years away from Earth, where um, you know you would expect it just to come in a straight line towards you, and for this on-off comparison to be sufficient. Now. You know, we've never got to this stage, but this is sort of the next stage we will get at where we're excited enough about a signal that we've seen. Um, we're like, we really think this, you know, looks very interesting. We've got to call up somebody else at another telescope and have them take a look at this. And then they take a look, different conditions, you know, different time of night or whatever, different location on the Earth, point their telescope at the star. And if they see something interesting, oh, okay, well now, you know, now everybody's interested. Now we've got to kind of marshal our resources and we're all going to point at this. And I think what you would see, you know, if it really is a narrowband transmitter on a planet that's orbiting the star, you would actually see that shift, that Doppler shift as the planet's orbiting the star and it would correspond to the orbital period. And I mean, this assumes, you know, by the way, and I haven't got into any of this, but this assumes that it's a beacon that is switched on all the time. It's not something that goes on and off. Um, you know, it's not something that's pointed in a particular direction maybe and then kind of scans across and points at somebody else. I mean, there's a whole bunch of, uh, you know, things that I've swept under the rug today uh, that, believe me, we've thought about <laughs> um, and sort of worried about it at some level, uh, you know, that, that are not the simplest case of either somebody with a very powerful transmitter that's transmitting in all directions all the time or somebody that knows where we are and has decided to send a message our way and is kind of tracking us and, and beaming that message in our direction. So, you know, there are a whole bunch of circumstances where we might not see a, a persistent signal that don't necessarily rule it out as being real. But again, sort of to sort of paraphrase, um, you know, Kikoni and Morrison and some of these other people, 
Um, well, and to also to, to quote directly Jill Tata, who is uh, one of the SETI pioneers over at the SETI Institute. Um, so there's other work that's going on across the Bay in Mountain View at the SETI Institute. And Jill says, I like this quote, she says, we reserve the right to get smarter. Um, so, you know, maybe we're doing a stupid thing right now, or maybe you're like, come on, Steve, like you really should be doing, you know, X, Y, Z. You shouldn't be looking at narrow band signals. You should be looking at broad band signals. You should be looking for intermittent signals. You shouldn't be looking for beacons. You should be looking for, you know, and whatever. You shouldn't be looking in radio. You should be using gravitons or something, I and mean, whatever it is. Okay, like, we'll get to that once we've done the best experiment that we know how to do right now with the conditions um, that, that, and, and the instrumentation that we have available to us. And maybe that's sufficient. And maybe they are all over the place out there. Maybe there's tons of them. Uh, and you know, the thing that blows my mind as well is if you think about the discovery of, of extrasolar planets. I mean, I started the talk by saying we knew of zero, right? And then the first candidate planets that were discovered, people looked at the data and they're like, yeah, that's a bit weird, particularly since the first one that was discovered was actually in orbit around a pulsar. Like planets around a pulsar, like that, that, well, it's not where they're supposed to be. They're supposed to be around nice stars like the sun and you know, like this is probably wrong. Turned out actually that was right. Uh, and then we found more and then we found kind of giant planets like Jupiter, but they were in orbits like Mercury. So these were these hot Jupiters that were going like, should they exist? I don't know, these, those look weird. And then we finally, you know, we've just begun to discover rocky planets like the Earth, some of which are in kind of close to Earth-like orbits. And this is, you know, really 30 years on from the first detection of exoplanets and, you know, several more decades from the beginning of this as a field of study. And so I think probably, you know, SETI is going to go the same way. If we make a detection, the first thing is going to be, really? Like, it's a bit weird. You know, that's not very convincing. And then somebody else looks at it, and it's still there. It looks like it's coming. Yeah, but seriously, like aliens? I don't know. Like, can we get any information out of this? No, it's really faint. It's just above the threshold of, of detection. You know, we can't figure out what they're saying or if there's any encoding in this. Well, and eventually, you know, you rule a bunch of stuff out. And, well, okay, we think we made a detection. And then the really exciting thing is going to be detection number two, detection number three, detection number 100 detection number a thousand and that's kind of that blows my mind and I work on this every day that we might get to the stage where we're in a similar situation to where we are with planets now where I don't know if any of you remember the last planet that was discovered do you remember a news article coming out about that was it splashed all over the you know front page of the New York Times or the evening news it was probably buried somewhere you know if it was even in there it was in the, the science section somewhere and you probably didn't hear about it and it's kind of weird to imagine that we might get to the same stage with finding other civilizations. Um, I think that the one sort of caveat to this is that if we can get a signal that we can decode, if we get a signal that we can interpret, and if, you know, if it's, and the term that's used is anti-cryptographic, in other words, it's sort of one that basically contains the information that you need in itself to make sense of itself, so you can kind of unpack it and, and read it. And if it's like the blueprints for a star drive, or, you know, the secret to world peace, or, you know, immortality, or whatever, or, you know, if it's some super weapon that destroys us all or whatever. I mean, you know, there's like, there's a number of kind of sci-fi scenarios that you, that you could come up with here. I mean, that, that's when kind of all bets are off in terms of sort of, you know, once we begin to understand signals and their information content, but we're not anywhere near there yet. We're just kind of trying to find the things, trying to really, you know, it's sort of, I started off with, I think the first slide was, are we alone? And um, I guess you can't prove a negative, so we're never going to, so to be able to turn that around and say, yes, we are alone, there's nobody else out there. But I think if, if we make one other detection, you know, a single detection, there's going to be more that follow. The only weirder, weirder thing than there being one inhabited planet in the universe would be if there are exactly two. <laughs>